the lovely light green glow you're observing here is on a piece of equipment that we use for demonstration and in some labs to demonstrate Thompson's experiment, uh, the experiment credited with discovering the electron in physics. And I should apologize in advance for the very rough production character of this video. The point is to give a tour for certain classes uh, where I show the equipment in front and not everyone catches everything they wanted to about it. So I'm going to have to pause at times to turn the room lights on and off. I'm sorry there's some room noise that cannot be avoided uh, for equipment we have in here. But hopefully you'll enjoy the tour. I'm going to now turn the room lights on uh, after I come back uh, turn some of the equipment off and point out the equipment and how it's wired up here and then play with the experiment a little bit. So you'll notice that with the room lights on the view is quite different. In fact, uh, you can see the mirror behind that green glow even better than you see the glow itself, I think. As I turn off the magnet voltage, you see, instead of the ring, just a, a short stub. That's a feature, of course. And we're going to talk about what makes that feature, how the experiment works, and how the equipment works as I go on. But let me turn off another supply and begin our little tour of the equipment. Now, this whole experiment works on two principles. It's all about accelerating charges in magnetic fields. So the first thing I want to point out under this shroud here, which keeps the room lights or the ambient light from being overpowering overall, there are two coils of wire, very thick copper wire. The two coils together um, uh, <laughs> uh, contribute to what we call a Helmholtz coil. Helmholtz coil is just a particular configuration of magnetic coils where the radius of two solenoidal coils is equal to the distance between them. This produces an incredibly uniform magnetic field in the central region, right in the middle there. You might wonder, why don't we just make one big coil across the whole thing. Frankly, part of the reason just has to do with the amount of power we want to use and heat we would generate, but also the more open configuration allows you to view what's going on a lot better. Inside this glass bulb, it is not vacuum, nor is it air. I honestly don't remember what gas is in it, but it is uh, a slightly low pressure gas that when charges move through it, glows, it fluoresces. Uh, the details of how that work are not important. Neon would work, that'd be fine. Uh, a lot of other gases would work, it's not neon, it's glowing the wrong color. And again, I honestly can't remember and don't care. The mirror on the back here, you could not see before, but hopefully we'll get some view, yes, where you can tell that's got little marks on it. It's actually not just a mirror, it's a ruler. It's not a ruler that needs any lens for adjustment, it's just a plain ruler that allows you to measure the radius of that ring we were just looking at. In the experiment, as electrons move out from the small piece of metal on the bottom, they move at high speed, the force due to magnetic field on a moving charge, Q times velocity cross product with magnetic field strength, gives an acceleration. When you work through the details of directions, you find that that acceleration is toward the center of this apparatus. A force provided toward the center may be what provides a centripetal force, and in this case it is. 
a centripetal force which keeps the electrons moving around in a circle. You know how to calculate centripetal force. That's force mass times velocity squared over radius of the circle. Thus the need for a ruler to measure the radius of the circle. So one of the measurements you're going to make if you do this as a lab, if you treat it quantitatively as a, a demonstration, is the radius of the circle that still that, that gives you Q over M, charge over mass, if you know the velocity of the electrons. A priori, you do not. Knowing the voltage through which they're accelerated tells you their energy per unit charge, because that's what voltage is all about. But if you don't know their mass, and how would you if you don't know Q over M, then you don't know what velocity that corresponds to. Thompson's brilliant contribution here was realizing that there is a way to get that velocity. And I'll point to that in a minute. I said I wanted to give you a tour of the equipment. Let me show you the equipment. We're in a macro mode here, and I'm not sure if you can read everything on the screen, but there are several uh, possible hookups here. It says voltmeter. That's for actually measuring uh, the voltage accelerating these electrons if you, if you want to do this quantitatively. Deflect plates. Note that there's nothing in there that has to do with the velocity measurement. I'll talk about that in a minute. And a pair labeled together electron gun with one of them saying electrodes and the other saying heater. The way an electron gun works requires a heater. On the other side of this apparatus, inputs for Helmholtz coils. Already talked a bit about that. And current adjust. That adjusts the electric current in those coils, which then can adjust the magnetic field, or by which you can adjust the magnetic field. Uh, since I'm going through the equipment, and I want to show what's in our lab, because this is the thing that I've shown to classes, uh, there is a high voltage power supply here with an AC hooked up to the heater. You can't actually tell which way that goes because wires are ganged together, but that goes to the heater. Uh, 3 amp max uh, AC, it's just a clicking knob. We leave it set at 6. Sometimes people use a lower setting actually. DC, there's a minus 50 volt or a plus 500 volt. The plus 500 volt is what we use for the acceleration. On the top box that controlled the whole apparatus, it said that the input for the electrode should be between 150 and 300 volts. So we use this 500 volt power supply there, but we try not to turn it up all the way. Uh, we read the meters. I don't have it on now, so there's nothing to read. On the other side, we have a separate power supply for uh, just the Helmholtz coils. This is actually used as a current supply, not a voltage supply, but frankly, it doesn't matter. We leave it hooked up the same way, and you can control the current through the box on the top at some level. Uh, it does need to be high enough out of this to do that. So now I'm going to start turning things back on. When I turn on the power supply that controls the electron gun, you can see I'm on, on my DC. I've got 126 volts here. I want to turn that up a little more. Let me go to about 200. If I were doing this quantitatively as a laboratory, I would try to get a value that's right about what I want but then I would measure up here and see exactly what value I have because that's what I really want to use in a calculation. As the heater is turned on, you can see maybe a little glow in a wire there. It looks kind of like a toaster that's heating up or an old-fashioned incandescent light bulb heating up. That's exactly what it's like 
and move back to the camera and the tripod again so it's stable for you to look at. It's not only like it is the same as one of those things heating up. The hot metal has electrons moving around very quickly within it and at its surface. If there is a voltage nearby, some of those electrons might be pulled off of that surface and that's how they're accelerated. When I talk about this in classes, I tend to uh, describe how they're accelerated away from there as a series of plates with holes in them. In the real apparatus, they're actually collars, not plates. Doesn't make any difference. It's done some way. I'm going to put the hood back on so we can start to see what's going on with the experiment. That gives some darkness here. Hopefully you can start to see there is some beam coming out. I have not turned on the magnet, so that beam is moving straight. I'm going to turn off the room lights again now. Hopefully the camera remains focused. Yes, it does, and I can see that I can see that pencil beam coming out straight. Since there's no accelerating magnetic field, of course, it just goes straight. If I were doing the speed measurement, I would need to attach electrodes. Oh, sorry, need to pan out a little. I would need to have a voltage on a deflection plate. And in class I talk about, and I want to talk about this quantitatively, uh, exactly where that voltage goes, but that's a voltage that would go up and down, and when I turn on the magnetic field, I can attempt to cancel it with a voltage vertically. Uh, I need to change a switch here for two different experiments. There's, it does nothing now because the magnetic field's not on and I have no voltage on. Uh, I can, while I'm here, try to focus this beam a little better, make it look sharper. And in the room, I can tell that that's getting a little sharper. Maybe you can, maybe you can't on camera. But now that I've not done, but talked about how I might do the velocity measurement, let me move angle up a little bit again and turn on my magnetic field. The moment I turn it on, I see the ring. I can zoom in a little more. Now if I know the value of the velocity from the deflection measurement. Basically, I look for the beam to go straight when there's a known magnetic field, which I've calculated knowing coil properties and the current. The electric field that it takes to cancel that will have charge cancel and mass not occur in the equation that balances those. The velocity only appears on the side with the magnetic force. So that gives me an equation with velocity only in one place. Now that I know the velocity and already know the magnetic field, I can calculate Q over M from the radius of that circle. This is what Thompson did. Uh, frankly, cathode ray tubes were known for quite some time before Thompson. But the idea that the cathode ray, as it was called, was actually a particle with specific particle properties was something no one had proven. And that's why this experiment is said to uh, discover the electron. Even though people have worked with cathode rays, the X-ray machine predates this by some time. Uh, when I use this as a demonstration in class, I like to play around with it a little bit. So one of the things I like to do is bring another magnet nearby. I've got this little magnet from a lapel pin, and maybe you can't see it well, but I can, I can make this circle into a spiral. If I take a big magnet from the lab, I've got a big one sitting over here, getting it anywhere nearby, I can 
distort that completely. Great fun can be had. Running out of time for the video, so I'm going to stop here. Enjoy. <laughs>